508, hello. Congratulations on your successful com completion and absolutely killing the midterm. You guys did great uh, yesterday on the 10th, and today is Thursday 11th, and I wanted to hold off on this lecture. This is an important lecture to begin with anyways because we're transitioning out of the biology into um, applications that you guys are going to use on, on, a, on a routine ba basis in your practice. The reason you're taking these classes, the reason you're in our program is that you um, – want to have a career someday, but you, you also want to apply what you're using and put it to practice um, in a positive way. All righty, so, um, so we go right into the readings right here. Okay, and we'll scroll down to where we're at. And um, I do want you guys to pat yourselves on the back. This was the last section on the biology, and you've done amazingly well. Um, you guys really do have a complete understanding of this and the importance of it. I think a lot of you were taken aback by this interaction between your immune system and your brains. Uh, it's kind of incredible how we can look at um, a life history of infections, a life, life history of injuries, because the immune system participates in, in tissue repair and wound repair as well as in um, fighting off infections. And if, and if we're in this chronic state of inflammation, the inflammatory messengers, the um, the little molecules that all the immune system cells use to interact and coordinate their activities also get up into the brain. And, uh, and it's kind of incredible to think about the chronic effect of those on the brain and cause this um, uh, switch um, in terms of anxiety, depression, the uh, amygdala hijack, and, and the continued activation of the HPA axis. Okay? And this HPA axis, when activated, will then impair the ability of the immune system to fight off that chronic infection and problem. So you can see this is very circular. This is a whole career of psychoimmunology. What can we do to improve our outcomes? Okay, And right here, the most important thing, we talk about it right here, I review it, is sociology. Sociality. Okay, So... Um, this particular study is, is like the grandfather of all studies, a 70-year longitudinal study where they followed hundreds of people throughout their lifespan, handed from generation to generation of researcher, which is tough, and trying to reduce um, sample attrition because oftentimes people will fall out of a study. Okay? In, the, in the end, they looked at all the health variables, diabetes, infections, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, you name it, okay, heart disease, and um, did an amazingly complex statistical analysis, regression studies, interactive statistics, and they found the number one predictor of a healthy life, and therefore also a happy life, was um, the, your, the sociality, the social connections, and it wasn't the number, it was the quality, okay? So this is reviewed by Dr. Waldinger in this study here, right here, and so it's only a 12-minute video. I highly recommend you watch this. Um, what's, what's interesting, too, is, is, you know, he says that about a quarter of our country suffers from this epidemic of loneliness that then impacts our overall health. Okay, so then we can come down here and we see that corporations are taking notice finally, okay? Um, this is a, a complete study by IBM um, that is a meta-analysis that brings together all kinds of studies, okay? Um, as a corporation, okay, um, you, you know, your bottom line right here is you want to be have a financially productive workforce so that you continue to be a viable entity in the business world, okay? Um, the key to that is to have a healthier, happier workforce, okay? That makes them more efficient, and they can then achieve this goal, okay? And um, through their analysis, they find that, that they're finding that the, the um, corporate culture has to change to mitigate this loneliness epidemic. Um, and if, the, if, if the corporations put more emphasis on this, then the outcome is going to be um, not only a happier workforce, but a um, productive workforce, okay, so, so that you will win as a corporation. All righty. So this is the PDF file. You just click on this right here takes you to um, this study. It's, again, it's an amazing study. So I'm just going to scroll by page by page. You hear me see, see me clicking down here. Um, it gives you a little background on, um, on IBM, okay? A little background about the impetus of the study, 
um, uh, some of the demographics of aging and also um, uh, the, the, the fact that, that many, many, many different entities are now starting to see that um, studying loneliness and mitigating loneliness is a super valuable thing to do, okay? Um, this is all about um, improving how older people engage with the world right there. Okay, so they break it down, okay, into the uh, kind of the uh, public health uh, epidemiology, okay? They talk about the, the difficulties in identifying this, that, that, that we are never really sampled by our healthcare practitioners to ask us, are you lonely? What's your social support with like? They ask you if you have a family history of heart disease, you know? So this is, has to change right here. And this talks about some of the, the obstacles and what you can do to take action, okay? So here's some key questions that can be asked right here, okay? Um, why? Why, do, why is it important for organizations to, to have, have a better grasp of understanding loneliness and what can be done, okay? Um, when we know what precipitates loneliness, loneliness then we can have um, a better opportunity to institute change. What are the hurdles, the difficulties, okay, in mitigating loneliness? Um, and, um, and so um, what can we do today in terms of the aging population? And then what's the future? All right, so uh, again, this is a really easy article to read. Um, here's the analysis of the increase in disease load associated with loneliness. Pretty scary, pretty scary. Heart disease, um, dementia, okay, and an increased likelihood of death. They break it down into what's happening at the individual and the impact it has on their health, but also um, when people are lonely and they don't have support, then the burden is, is put on the shoulders of a caregiver and, and the health consequences that has. So the combination of health consequences of the individual and the caregiver, and it is discussed through this article, okay? And how we have a public societal duty to fix this problem, okay? Put resources into this problem and, and stop putting resources into developing all these new drugs. Um, because it'll have such a greater impact. Public health is such an amazing thing in that way. All right, so why precipitates loneliness, okay? So we, it goes over all this right here, and I'm going to read this for you, but it's really straightforward um, reading. They break it down into the individual and what the initiators are, okay? And then also some societal initiators, okay? These figures, as they lay them out here, they talk about it point and point and point, and the figures are just there to help you out, okay? Um, they break down into figure right here, the challenges, okay, of, um, of loneliness, okay? Um, obstacles of taking action and the lack of uh, current effective solutions. And then here it is, obstacles to, to, to taking action, okay? Again, we don't have good screening, okay? When you go to see the doctor, they don't screen for this. They don't screen for the fact that loneliness is a comorbidity with other health health conditions. Okay, um, there is this social stigma. Okay, because we live in a socially connected world. God, if I have to hear that again, I don't even know what I'm going to do. Um, that people feel like they're not socially connected, and therefore they're an outsider. Okay, and that becomes a downward spiral. All right. Um, this is the other part of that figure. The lack of effective solutions, okay? Um, the stakeholder being uh, a large corporation like USC or IBM or the federal government, okay? They have very fragmented, incomplete trajectories of how we're going to fix this. Um, there's a complete disconnect. I see this at USC all the time where the left hand doesn't know what the right hand's doing. Um, and, um, and then there's this assumption um, that I think is changing now that older people do not like technology. And, and how can we use technology to connect everybody, okay, in a, in a positive way, okay? <laughs> um, so they break it down, okay, um, about how, how it can be alleviated on the individual level, the community level, and as you see the next one, the national level, maybe some government programs, okay, maybe some government grants. All right, so... What does the future hold? I told you this was a, a pretty easy read, okay? 
um, colloquial, but we got to create a new village. We have to have a new approach, okay? Um, we got to see how we can engage peoples at the community level, okay? Um, how do we achieve new insight, okay? So we have to figure out a better way to detect loneliness and intervene more effectively, okay? Um, rebuilding social capital, all right? So we got to create um, this social vibrancy in later life, okay? We retire and we lose this connectiveness, okay? There has to be a better plan. How much? Not leave it up to the individual, okay? Um, this natural plan that's out there that um, in the end will um, will be a beneficial benefit to everybody at the society level, okay? So here is a kind of a, a plan, the platform. And um, again, this it kind of have fun figures in this paper that, that make you think about it, and then they they go through what it is you got to do. Now here's a, here's a an old concept that we we kind of lost sight in in America. I was 18, I moved away, and I never came back. You know, um, why not instead of four generations buying individual houses, why not we just buy one nice house and have all four generations live in it? That way, I wouldn't have had had a nanny that beat on my kids. Okay, that way I wouldn't have had to had uh, uh, issues with childcare. Okay, Julie and I were both working. It was such a hassle. My parents, you know, lived far enough away that then we had to worry about their caregiving. If we could have just brought it all together and lived in one household, the way so many other cultures have done, or the way human history has done for years, things would have been better. Okay. We need more opportunity when we exit the workplace, okay? It's exactly what I'm talking about. We have to have a better plan. And, um, you know, uh, I think the future is going to hold uh, better delivery of goods and the better delivery of the person to resources, okay? Um, and that's what that's all about. All right. So this, again, goes through um, the different concepts here. Um, that's a short article. I think you're going to love it. All right. Then we can come down here to this final article, um, and it puts social um, networks in um, to uh, a perspective with respect to what we've learned about in this class right now, okay? Um, social support, okay, um, and self-control, okay? These are two um, separate independent variables that I've been looking at stress and stress and, and stress-related health, and they go through this, okay? Self-control, something that uh, Julie has always told me and tells my boys as a, as a great um, instructor and, and mentor uh, that you can't control what people do to you. You can't control what happens oftentimes um, on a daily level, but you can control how you react to it, all right? And this is this top-down frontal cortex um, are you going to have a amygdala hijack or not, okay? And, um, and social support is a venue to make sure you don't have that amygdala hijack. Okay? So that's what this paper is all about. And we can look down. They define stress. And I want to, give, again, pat you guys on the back. Just think about a couple weeks ago, you would have read this and said, what are they talking about, okay? Here's the HPA axis, which you guys are experts in. Here's the fast component of the stress response, which you guys are experts in, okay? Um, so they describe it. You already have this you know, thing figured out. And then we look at self-control, that top-down frontal cortex that decides whether or not there's going to be a amygdala hijack or not, okay? All right, so again, it's a cool overview. And then they talk about whether or not you have good self-control. And the physiological and psychological homeostasis that, that, that is related to this, all right? So again, just, I'm not gonna um, read this for you, but, but again, that frontal cortex is where we have uh, coping responses. How do we deal with this, okay? And, uh, or do we lose our ability to cope and whether, what are the, the uh, problems with that? If you know somebody that has these problems, Social interactions are a super good way. They go over the review of, of social interactions and the benefits to health. They go over the, um, um, the biology. Um, this right here, oxytocin, is an amazing hormone. Some background that I can give you on this. Um, it's known for what it does in childbirth. Okay, 
So um, for women, when your uterus is, sorry, slowly stretching, 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 centers, sensors inside your uterus will detect how big it has got. It then fires neurons that communicate with the hypothalamus to release oxytocin into the blood. The oxytocin goes down to the uterus and causes it to start contracting, and you have childbirth. All right, and all that oxytocin gets released in the brain to give this amazing, loving connection, a lifetime connection between a mom and its child. Same thing happens with um, with suckling, okay? So um, uh, what happens is uh, nipple stimulation causes oxytocin to release and causes the milk glands to contract. And mom then has an amazing connection. These are huge bursts, okay? Just shaking hands, patting somebody on the back, hugging, okay? The, the love that you feel for somebody also causes oxytocin to be released. Why is this so important? Oxytocin is implicated in a reduction in the overall cortisol release during stress. All right? So this is an, a method of intervention that you can do in your life on a daily basis, but you also incorporate into your workplace solution. Okay? All right. So again, it goes over this concept of interaction between self-control control, and social support. A fairly short article, an amazing article, actually. Okay. All righty. So we go from there. Um, you do your quizzes, okay? Um, and then you come in here to your discussion board, all right? And we see that we are now going to ask you now to take control, okay, of your workplace, all right? And we're going to ask you, this goes over the report of loneliness, and we want you to do, um, and we want you to reflect, uh, what, how you've witnessed loneliness, maybe uh, a friend, maybe a workmate, okay? Um, what do you think uh, it uh, happened to that person? How did it play out, okay? Um, did it affect their psychological well-being and overall health? Now, what did that do to them in the future, all right? So now you are a practitioner. How will you identify loneliness? How are you going to bring awareness to this? And how are you going to intervene to reduce loneliness? as a practitioner, okay? Because I think this is kind of where the future uh, really resides, okay? Um, I can tell you right up, for me, um, the social support, the, the interactions, the connections that I have with Julia, um, it's the most valuable thing ever in my life. You know, we are nauseating how close we are, and we've been that way for 37 years, okay? It allows me to, to have kind of historical happiness, okay? so that I can be nostalgic, um, I can reminisce, we can go back to all the amazing things that we've done together in our life. It's incredible, it's incredible. And I can't tell you how value that is, value that, valuable that is. I have a lot of gratitude about that and I'm gonna be bringing that in as my, my last lecture. There she is right there. Um, this is uh, where you see the engagement ring right there. Okay, so this is fairly early on after we were married and we're down at the, uh, um, uh, San Diego Wild Animal Park. Um, she's just an incredibly happy, vibrant person. She's my my everything. She's my financial planner. She's so good at the Fidelity website. She is our chief staff psychologist for me and my two boys. She's an incredible attorney. Um, she's a philanthropist. She raised hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars for our school district. There's actually a Julia Walsh Garden that she got a grant for. That's for our local elementary school. And um, she's this incredible resource that, um, that uh, if you ever need to talk to somebody, she would be definitely there for you. All righty, guys. So I want to end there. I want you to throw yourselves into this last, um, I would say, third of the course because this is right up your wheelhouse. And this is how you're going to change the world. We'll see you next time.